So recently we released a video looking at 75 watch terms that every watch enthusiast needs to know. But given just how loaded of a subject watches can be, even 75 terms was not enough. So what we needed to do is create another video looking at an additional 60 terms in this one that we're gonna be looking at today that you need to know as a watch enthusiast. So I'll just mention this. If you have not seen the first video looking at 75 watch terms, definitely go watch that after this video or pause this one, open another tab, check that one out. Also, we have other instructional videos like eight things to know about watches. If you just wanna kinda of get into this world of terminology and things to know, I have quite a few different videos on the channel to check out and those are definitely probably the two top ones that I would recommend to look at. Also, before we jump into this video, definitely check out 50 of the best watches under $5,000 in 2021, link down below to the blog on our website, teddybaldestar.com. So definitely go check that out. Nice comprehensive guide to some of the best watches in the industry under $5,000. Be sure to check that one out. All right, so in this video, we're gonna go through a few different sections and this one's gonna be a little bit more in the weeds for specific topics. One thing I will say too, when talking about some of these topics, it's a little bit less definitive and concrete on some of these terms, and I'll try to make that known when that is happening, but things like different hands and dials and what is widely accepted universally is sometimes not as straightforward as other things that we've looked at in the past. So just keep that in mind. Don't come at me with the pitchforks for certain things. Just kind of going to provide my understanding as well as what I would say most enthusiasts uh, believe is going to be the case for many of these terms. So let's start ourselves off with looking at different dial types, because I think this is important when understanding watches and being able to describe different types of watches and what is their appearance really uh, evoking here. So now the first dial type here is the linen dial. So this is often associated with early Rolex Datejust models. The linen dial is characterized by a subtly textured pattern of vertical and horizontal grain executed in a white, silver, or often off-white color that creates a woven effect similar to that of a textile like linen. Then we have our gilt dial. So this generally means covered in gold, but in the watch world typically refers to the use of gold tone printed markers set against black primary dial surface. Gilt is often talked about when regarding early Submariner references or when talking about it from a modern context, the Tudor Black Bay 58. So next up we have Grand Fou or enamel dials. Apologies for my French on the get-go. This means great fire in French or in English really just going to be referred to as enameling. This involves wafer thin metal discs that become the dial and multiple layers of glass powder that's deftly sifted on layer by layer and fired upwards of 800 degrees Celsius to create a final surface, often being done in exotic ways and being able to show some true artisanal precision in the execution. Next up, we have a tapisserie dial. So this is a dial texture characterized by a repetitive use of tiny squares separated with fine channels that is traditionally executed with a rose engine or guilloche machine. The execution of this and that kind of pattern can be done with larger markers or with smaller ones. Also, I'll just kind of mention that as a side note, and this is where it starts getting a little bit more confusing, is you'll also hear tapestry dials being used to describe Rolex watches, primarily date just and things of that nature by featuring long vertical recesses within the dial. Next, we have hobnail or clou de Paris. This is another technique achieved with a similar process to tapisserie rose engine or through a simplified pressing process. Hobnail features more of a prominent faceting of each of those individual square elements of a waffle style pattern and less of a channel in between. Each little square resembles the head of a old timey hobnail often used in shoes in the 18th century. Next, we have waffle dials. So this is similar to tapestry, but often used to denote when the waffle texture is simpler or achieved by a way of a mechanical pressing process, as opposed to most time consuming and difficult mechanical chiseling and guilloche process described above. In addition, it is commonly going to have larger recesses rather than the inverse of protruding areas like that in the previously mentioned dial styles. Next, we have sector. And the definition of a sector dial can vary a bit depending on who you ask but you're generally going to be looking for a series of concentric circles moving in from the dial outskirts with each of the circles often linked by straight lines at the hour positions. This design style has become synonymous with classic 1930s and 40s watches and has recently seen a huge resurgence in popularity. The next up we have a California style dial. So this is a dial that typically has Roman numerals on the top half of the dial with more traditional Arabic numerals on the lower half. However, you will see the inverse of this, and this is going to be known as a reverse Cali dial. So now you have the crosshair. So this is a dial that features a prominent pair of printed 
perpendicular lines meeting at the dial center. The crosshair is often found in many vintage watches and is sometimes combined with a sector dial as you will see with the Longines Heritage Classic sector. Then you have your teak dial. So these are characterized by three dimensional lines that typically run from 12 to six o'clock and imitate the grain of a teak boat deck most often associated with Omega's Aquaterra collection. And then finally, you have the pie pan, most commonly associated with vintage Omega constellations and the Globemaster. The pie pan dial is known for looking more or less like an overturned pie pan, creating a three-dimensional effect with the protruding center and angled perimeter of the dial. Now for this next section, I wanna look at different luminescent material. And the one I wanna look at first is one that you're never going to see nowadays, and that is radium. So you're gonna rarely see this now due to issues with emitting a dangerous level of radioactivity with this material. Radium was once used on the original Panerai dive watches as well as some early Rolex models. Radium now has been outlawed in terms of being used in consumer products, and that was done in the late 1960s. Now next up we have tritium, and we'll look at this in two parts. First with tritium paint. So this luminescent material was used by the vast majority of watches up until the adoption of Luminova and Superluminova in the 1990s. Tritium paint has a good balance of glowing brightly while also lasting for a long time, all with lower and safer levels of radioactivity compared to that of radium by a large margin. Though tritium paint is going to age over time and is gonna also have a different off-white color, that's where you're gonna start seeing that patina happen. And for some people, depending on who you ask, this is a huge upside. Most times you're gonna be able to notice when tritium is gonna be present on a dial because it will be denoted at the bottom near that six o'clock position. Now as something a little bit different, you have tritium tubes. So encapsulated tritium tubes are essentially tiny glass tubes filled with tritium gas that glow without the need for an external light source. However, given the tube construction, options can be limited in terms of the dial and hand designs. And the half-life of tritium is limited to approximately 12 years, meaning dial replacement for long-lasting watches might be tough to avoid if you want to get that kind of shining appearance that it comes with right out of the box. But I think the important thing to know here is it's constantly illuminating, and in complete darkness, it is actually going to be a more reliable material. And now finally, the most popular now from a modern context, Superluminova and Luminova. This is a non-radioactive and non-hazardous compound which doesn't degrade over the lifetime of the watch in the way that tritium paint paint does. It's available in a number of different colors and grades, though blue and green seem to glow the brightest. Superluminova also has a much higher peak of brightness after being charged compared to the constant illumination of tritium, but it is known for having a rapid fade when left in complete darkness and a gradual fade from there over several hours. But from a modern context, this is by far going to be the most popular illuminating material that you are going to find. So now I wanna move into different types of hands, and this is an area where it's not necessarily as universal for definitions. But starting off here, we have alpha hands. These are characterized by an elongated triangular shape with a narrow stem at the base. You might also find a similar yet slimmer execution, usually absent of loom, called lance hands. Now we have sword hands. These are known from models like the Seamaster 300. Sword hands are typically loomed and like many other types of hands, named after their shape. Sword hands have a more fluid classification and there are different executions of these styles, no question about it. Next you have plongeur hands. These are similar to sword hands and commonly associated with the Omega Plopro. These hands are characterized also by a shorter pencil style hour hand and a larger sword style minute hand. Then we have Breguet hands, and Breguet is of course one of the industry's oldest watch brands being founded in 1775, and in their many years of developing pieces, they popularized a hand style that featured a slim build and a hollow circular end just before the end point. This signature handset currently is used on many dress watches even outside the brand and evokes a traditional style. Next we have cathedral hands. These are designed in a way that mimics the ornate patterns found on the stained glass windows, often found in cathedrals. Cathedral hands are seen on dressier watches as well as many field watches, including the Seiko Alpinist collection or Oris with the big crown pointer date. Next we have syringe hands, another hand named after its shape. The syringe hand often features a loomed rectangular central portion with a point at the end to really emulate a syringe. Then you have snowflake hands. When it comes to brand essentially owning a style of hand, this definitely is going to be an example of that being pretty much only seen on vintage Tudor Submariners as well as the current Black Bay and Pelagos collection from the brand. Snowflake refers to the shape of the hour hand intended to help differentiate it from the pencil style minute hand and offer up some great legibility in low light situations. 
Then we have Mercedes hands. This is another design commonly associated with the Rolex family. Mercedes hands are characterized by the design of the hour hand that sports a circular end divided in three equal portions resembling the Mercedes logo. Another popular example of an hour hand following this format is a lollipop hand. So essentially the same execution of the Mercedes, except the circle isn't going to be divided. You also see the classifications of lollipop and snowflake being used when you're talking about the end of a second hand, whether you're talking about different Rolex models or the latest Omega Seamaster 300s. Next up, we have leaf hands, and leaf hands are another set of watch hands named after their shape, showcasing a broader center typically cut in a diamond-esque shape, usually featuring loom at the center. These are commonly found on Flieger-style pilot watches or classic chronographs. Now for one of the most popular hands out there, we have Dauphine hands. Mostly being seen on dress watches, Dauphine hands feature an elongated triangular shape that is typically faceted at the center. Next, we have baton hands, and these are a bit contested on a precise definition. Some will classify baton hands as being the rounded off hands on the likes of the AP Royal Oak. Others might also include the straight rectangular shaped versions that follow the same general format, but is going to have a more pointed one, while others might call these stick hands. There are also blunted hands that are absent of a point that will fall into this category as well. I will just leave this one a bit more open, but baton hands, certainly something you need to be familiar with. Then you have arrow hands. While the general look of an arrow hand is easy to grasp, it's worthy of note that arrow hands are often seen as an hour or minute hand paired with another type of hand as in Seiko's SKX collection of divers or that of the Omega Broad Arrow divers. And then finally, we have pencil hands, and these are similar to baton hands or stick hands. I personally classify pencil hands as rectangular, loom-filled hands with a pointed tip that emulate the look of a pencil given their thickness and the point, such as what you'll find with the Zenith Chronomasters. All right, so now to move on to some different movement terms. And one term that we didn't talk about was kind of more relating to chronographs, and that was talking about column wheels. So this is a chronograph movement component shaped like a castle turret with three-dimensional teeth that are easy to detect on the back of the chronograph caliber. As the chronograph functions are stopped and started, levers fall in and out of place in these three-dimensional teeth in a way that creates a more tactile and snappy response. Column wheel chronographs are typically associated with being higher end and are more expensive and more complicated to produce and service. Then we also have the idea of vertical versus horizontal chronograph clutches. To put it simply, a clutch is going to be something that's going to mesh with the chronograph gear train from either a vertical or horizontal angle. A horizontal clutch can be desirable because it puts the chronograph's operation on full display, assuming you have an exhibition case back, though it can cause a jumpy chronograph seconds hand, requires a few more gears, and sometimes uses more energy from the mainspring compared to that of a vertical clutch. On the flip side, while the vertical clutch system is less in view, which can be viewed as a downside, it also typically creates a little bit less wear over time since the teeth are not meshing together in the same manner, creating less friction during the engagement. Now to move along to different types of watch case materials materials. And the first material that we have is bronze. So this is an alloy of copper, tin, and other metals, including aluminum, that has been popular in recent years, especially with dive watches from brands like Panerai, Tudor, and Oris, and others. Important thing here, it's an alloy, so it's really going to depend on the manufacturer and how the chemical makeup of that's going to be. Then you also have silver, kind of following the same format, specifically looking at sterling silver or 925 silver. This is composed of 92.5% of pure silver and 7.5% of other alloys, usually to add strength and durability just like that with gold. Then you have stainless steel. This is an alloy of ferrous metals and chromium, which is highly corrosive resistant and durable. Often seen as 316L, you also have 904L, which has a different chemical composition, including higher amounts of nickel and has further enhanced corrosion protection and is denser. And then you have gold. I don't think I need to go into too much detail what gold is, but in the watch and jewelry world, most often seen as 18 karat gold, which is going to be composed of 75% pure gold and 25% of alloys. But the different karat amounts are gonna be representative of how much pure gold is going to be in that material versus how much is gonna be made up of alloys. Then we have ceramic. This is an inorganic, non-metallic solid composed of a variety of compounds that are pressed into shape and then heated. Ceramic is generally lower in density and therefore lighter weight compared to steel, while also being three to four times harder and therefore much more difficult to scratch. 
but it is susceptible to cracking when coming into high speed contact with a hard object or surface like dropping it from a decent height. It is extremely expensive and difficult to work with and requires a variety of special equipment. Then also going in line with another material while also being much more lightweight while having a silverish hue, is titanium. Titanium is also going to come with several different grades. It's going to be used in different watches, primarily grade two versus grade five. Then we also have platinum. So platinum is a dense, precious metal that is highly unreactive and has a silver hue to it. From afar, it is hard to decipher from stainless steel and look, but is considerably heavier. Then you have tantalum. Tantalum, similar to platinum, is a dense metal that is highly corrosion resistant and has a bluish gray hue to it. And although rare, is most famously executed by F.P. Jorn with the Chronomet Blue. All right, so now we have different types of bezel inserts and scales. Now, I don't wanna get into things that we've looked at in previous videos, like a telemeter or a GMT. So these are going to be new things that we're gonna be looking at here. Now, one thing to mention with bezels, they can be fixed or externally rotating. So rotating bezels can be located either externally on the outside of the watch case to be operated by hand or internally needing an additional crown in order to operate. Then you have a elapsed time bezels. So this is going to be seen on dive watches. This rotating type of bezel features markings counting up to one hour, operating by aligning the 0 60 minute indicator with the minute hand, and then simply reading the elapsed time from the bezel's markers. These are most commonly associated with diver watches and are going to rotate one way in order to not get knocked and really set the unprecise time of how much duration you've had underwater, which when you're relying on these back in the day could have deadly consequences. Now we have countdown bezels, and this is the same concept as elapsed time, but with the positions of the markers reversed, such as that can be used to count down, not up, from 60 minutes to zero. Often seen on pilot watches as well as military watches, as having a timed objective can be essential for navigation or operational needs. These are also going to typically be bidirectional. Then we have one that's a bit more unconventional with tied bezels. One of the more obscure bezel types, a tide or tidal bezel, rotates and is aligned with a known high or low tide and then can keep track of the tidal cycle over a 24 hour period with specific often color coded markers. Now we have different bezel insert materials. Now while bezels themselves are often made of the same material as the case, the insert can be made from a variety of different materials. The most popular one is going to be anodized aluminum. Anodized aluminum inserts can be executed in a range of colors and are historically the choice of divers and GMT bezels from the likes of Omega and Rolex. Over time, aluminum inserts can fade from wear and exposure to sun, and the material is also not terribly scratch resistant. For these reasons, the majority of major luxury brands have now shifted over to materials like ceramic in recent years. Now, ceramic as a bezel insert is going to be much more durable compared to that of aluminum. It also features markers that are part of the material itself as opposed to being printed on top where they can be scratched off. Next we have sapphire, less common compared to ceramic but sapphire bezel inserts are also highly scratch resistant and basically feature a sapphire layer on top of the bezel. Then you have a classic old school one with Bakelite bezels. When it comes to vintage watches, this is going to be a material that you are going to hear about besides aluminum. Bakelite is a trade name for a family of plastics created from synthetic resins. This material can be scratched and prone to breaking, but does preserve any bezel markings under a coat of plastic, making them a common choice in vintage applications for dive watches. So now we have specific terms that are only being used by brands. So things that are going to refer to or coin terms, trademark terms by brands themselves. First one we have oyster. So this is used to refer to any case from Rolex intended to be watertight based on a design principle developed in 1926. Also the name of Rolex's popular three link style bracelet design as featured on the Submariner, the Explorers and Oyster Perpetual. Then you have another style, the Jubilee. So this is another Rolex innovation. The Jubilee was released in 1945 to celebrate Rolex's 40 year anniversary on the Datejust. It's characterized by larger half circle shaped links with the flat side against the wrist and a series of smaller semicircular links within that are often polished. The Jubilee is more flexible and therefore often very comfortable compared to some more stiffer bracelets on the market and recently made a reappearance on the GMT Master II collection. So then we have Trip Lock. This is the successor to Twin Lock crown designs, which featured two gaskets. The Trip Lock is Rolex's modern screw down crown as utilized by the Submariner and Sea Dweller and features three independent sealed zones and a slew of gaskets allowing for a reliable and durable watertight seal at the crown. Then you have Glide Lock. This is an extension system of Rolexes that is found in their sports pieces that offers tool free adjustment in two millimeter increments up to 20 millimeters of on the fly adjustment. Then we have a few 
terms from Seiko, first with Hardlex. So this is Seiko's name for his proprietary mineral crystal material as seen on tens of thousands of Seiko watches and is often seen on the more affordable side of the spectrum from the brand. And then you have Lumabrite. When it comes to Lum, especially on the affordable side, Seiko rules the roost. Divers like the SKX collection and many of the Seiko turtles and things of that sort feature this proprietary fluorescent luminescent paint, which is known for glowing not only brightly, but also for a long period of time. And now to wrap up this video, I wanna look at some important people in the world of watches that I think are just good when piecing together history and also just the structure of the industry. First up here, we have Abraham Louis Breguet. So this is a French watchmaker known for several improvements and creations during the late 18th century, such as his many adaptions to the lever escapement, and most famously with the creation of the tourbillon. He also was the founder of the storied brand Breguet in his name and is widely regarded as one of the greatest watchmakers to ever live and created many possibilities for future watchmakers after his developments. Now, next up we have Hans Vilsdorf. So this is a German entrepreneur known famously for founding Rolex and Tudor. During his time leading the charge at Rolex, he developed a brand that managed to transcend watches altogether. And the company developed some of the most iconic timepieces during his time at the helm. Despite his death in 1960, the Rolex organization operates under the control of the Hans Vilsdorf Foundation that was put into place in 1945, where the brand still tries to maintain the execution of his original vision. Now, next up, we have the Hayek family. And following the quartz crisis of the late 1960s and 70s, many brands were on the rocks and most were looking to wind down and liquidate their assets by the early 1980s. However, a Lebanese businessman known as Nick Hayek managed to revamp the operation, production, and distribution of many leading brands, merging existing organizations into a singular luxury conglomerate known as the Swash Group. The Swash Group currently operates brands such as Omega, Breguet, Blanc Pan, Tissot, and movement manufacturer Etta, just to name a few, and it is still led by the leadership of the Hayek family today. Next, we have Gerald Genta, easily the most famous watch designer to ever live, working with a variety of brands in his career, such as Omega, Universal Genève, IWC, most famously with Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet with the designs of the Nautilus and Royal Oak. As a testament to the staying power of his designs, some of his creations are still as relevant today as they were during their releases, with his design DNA being probably the most replicated in all of watches. And next we have George Daniels, widely regarded as the greatest watchmaker of the 20th century. George Daniels was an English watchmaker who is best known for his work in the development of the coaxial escapement, an alternative take on the escapement compared to the traditional Swiss lever, utilizing a modified pallet fork and escapement wheel in order to counteract the challenges of sliding friction to increase service intervals. His invention was met with skepticism by many of the leading brands that he was looking to sell the concept to. However, it lives on today in Omega's contemporary timepieces as well as by his former apprentice, Roger Smith. But all right, guys, that is 60 terms and concepts that watch enthusiasts should know on top of things that we've looked at in the past. That's a lot of information. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This was a lot of work to put together. So if you did find it helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Really would appreciate that. Uh, it does help the channel as well. Also be sure to check out teddybaldistar.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, full factory warranty for all the products that we carry. We also offer price match. So if you see one of our watches at another authorized dealer for cheaper, fill out the form and we'll be in touch with you. And finally, nine out of every $10 that we generate goes right back into the content we're creating, creating helpful videos like this one. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.